Hi, Ernest. So it's Hi. great to see you today. We're just going to be chatting a little bit about um, your work in Madagascar in the Deep mm -hmm. South. Um, so do you want to tell me firstly like how you got into this work? What inspired you to kind of start working in the Deep South in Madagascar? Um, yeah, so, so the Deep South um, is um, a self brief um, um, uh, um, filming and um, photography project, basically, so because I wanted to uh, highlight the human impact of um, climate drought and famine that is happening in this area. But I wanted to do it in a more um, dignified and respectful way because I'm passionate about it and I really want to show the world what's going on there in terms of uh, the impact, what uh, climate change, what drought is um, making people's life like really tough. Mm. And I've heard that you've worked in quite a few different areas. Do you want to maybe talk us through some of the places that you've been working and the impact that maybe had on you as well? Yeah, uh, particularly with the, with, the, with the Passion Project, uh, I've been visiting like um, two communities. One is called Tandava Baza, where I met a lady called um, Manaisu. And then there's another one uh, called um, Manitsevu, where I met uh, a 55 years old um, uh, lady called Florin. So um, they, 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 they have like two different stories, but kind of similar. So with Manaisu, um, I've spent like two weeks with these guys trying to understand, um, you know, and learn from them and uh, build relationship with these guys and really uh, hearing from them wh wh how they feel, how they, how they see things changing because of climate change. So with Manaisu, um, I was uh, spending days with these guys and uh, um, seeing what are they doing in the day, what, what are they doing to cope with, um, with the drought, with the climate, what are they fetching the, their water, what are they feeding uh, their family during the, the time of crisis, during the famine, what they do when they don't have anything to eat. So that is what I did. And uh, with the second lady, Florin, um, um, her story is more about like really how tough and uh, it is for her to, to find water to buy because the water in their village, the walk for water is really the longest walk for water I've ever seen. So it's like four or five hours walk just to get a bucket of water. So she ha she's no longer fetching water because she can't do it. So she has to buy water at a very high price. So um, she's, she's making two dollars a day, two GBP a day. Uh, she is running a little coffee shop to survive, but she has to buy water at 100 times more than our president, than our MPs. So that is her struggle. So she's buying water with the little money she makes from the coffee, coffee shop. And that she is really struggling because of that. And you were saying when you've been visiting some of these villages that you actually went on a walk yourself to try and find water. And I think you didn't really believe to start with that. Yeah, that's how far it actually was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I was there for the first time uh, and she told me, I mean, Florin told me it's going to take you five hours and let's don't go there. Then I was like, yeah, maybe she's like making it up because I'm, I'm a water trade person. I work for water trade stuff. So, but then I did it. So we, we started the walk at six. Yeah, and then uh, we were walking, it was amazing, the sun was rising, everything was like beautiful. I was taking photos, like filming and doing everything. I was excited, like really excited. And then um, after an hour and a half walk, I really started like really, you know, feeling like my skin like burning and the, the heat of the sun. And, and the walk was like really tough because um, it, it, you have like this um, sandy path and then mm -hmm cactus, his spines are everywhere, so it's, it was really crazy. And then um, after like an hour, half, two hours, like um, we made it to the river. It was just a small river bed, and there's a bit of water left on the, uh, on the, on the, on the river bed caused by the, the recent cyclone. That is why they're having a bit of water left. So the guys were like filling up the jail can, and then we hid it back to the village. And I knew that it's gonna be like really, really tough because the, the sun was like really getting stronger and stronger. And it was like, really we have to like climb back up like mm -hmm. hills and then valleys and hills before arriving to the village. And um, uh, we, we had like a little break every 30 minutes because uh, it, it was really, really, really uh, not easy for the guys and not for myself as well. I didn't bring anything. 
I didn't bring water, I didn't eat or something. So at some point during the break, I was, um, I was like picking up like, you know, cactus and then the guys were like grabbing my hand and then saying, no, don't, don't, don't eat it it's like this. We need to like wipe it and then that they helped me a bit. Otherwise I would be, I would get like inflammatory intestine or it's something. Poisonous. Exactly. Yeah. Because I was so thirsty on, on the walk. So um, I just want to grab something. And then um, uh, after like, I think it was like two hours of walking, um, I saw like a little group of, um, you know, little guys, like little children uh, with their own like a water container, like struggling with us. And then um, that is where I was, um, I was like really literally like crying because, um, because I think for me that was, that was like too tough. I mean, I'm used to like, uh, you know, traveling and, you know, documenting, you know, people walk for water for 10 years, but that was like the toughest walk I've ever seen. Uh, because because of the sun, because of the heat, because it was like a really hilly, because of the path, sandy path. So um, so I, w I was like really getting emotional, even though I told myself, you don't get emotional, Ernest. Mm -hmm. No, it's your job. You have to do it. But I did because that was that was too strong for me, though. I mean, like because it reminds me when I was little, I didn't have access to water. So I have to like, you know, go through this. But these guys are really, really, um, you know, going through like, I would say like really hell but because because that is what they have to do deal with every, every single day and when asked the little children told me they've left the village at 4 a.m before that, you yeah before and, and like two hours before us and now before they were little so they can't really like walk as fast as, as they want but the guys are, are, i went with was one of the strongest guys in the village so we were like a little bit got doing it like quicker than the others and then after like um, uh, in total, it was four hours and thirty minutes. Five hours, we made it to the village, um, and that was that was. I was like totally drained. Uh, I was. I didn't say anything. All I wanted was just water. I need to drink water, but that was like really crazy. And um, that's um, that's the reason why water in this um, particular village is um, cost like really high price because it, because no one is wanted to buy to to sell you water because it takes you like five hours to. To, to, to collect them. And the, that's the, the story of uh, the lady, um, Florin, in that village. She no longer has the strength to, you know, collect water. So she has to buy water from, from the guys who can, who still collecting water. And that's the reason why she has to pay it at a very, very high price. And you say, yeah, she has water, but the water she has as well is a contaminated water because this river is the only source of water that people, animals are using. That's the only one in the surrounding area. And it was um, a very contaminated water. And you were saying as well about the children having to do this walk for water as well. I know you had a bit, you had an experience as well where you met a child and, and sadly they passed away later on. That must be really hard for you to go back continuously to these communities yeah. and, and not be able to help as much as you'd like to. Yeah, I mean, yeah, because um, uh, because um, I, I met like a uh, Florin's grandson uh, when I was there um, doing this some um, uh, documentation, gathering stories, and that little boy used to, you know, like uh, play around me, and you know, used to be like kidding, uh, Uncle Ernest, what is my candy and stuff, and. Before coming to the UK, um, uh, I, I got a call and I've been told that she, he passed away. So that was really sad. Um, yeah, he, uh, I've been told by the community, but he was uh, by because of diarrhea. So yeah, must be has something to do with like the water they have, you know, the situation in their area because they, the the things are changing in terms of um, um, climate and weather. So they used to grow things. Um, properly before five years ago six years ago four years ago but because of them um, climate is changing the village is becoming like less productive and less productive so what is happening is like really water scarcity famine and then drought or if not that then they're hit by cyclone mm. so these guys are really like living in a very extreme conditions and obviously these situations you're they, they must be so hard to kind of comprehend and, and be th w live through that. But what I love about your work is that you, 
you try and, as you've already said, kind of put the dignified element into that, the humane element about that. We've seen so many kind of starving children and people on TV in general, but I feel like you're trying to do that a bit differently and maybe see them as humans rather than... Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that is what I, was, um, what I was trying to do and what I was doing because I wanted to, as a Malagasy person, I want, and as a virtual person, I wanted to do it in a more, the most like dignified way and respectful way possible. I could have gone for like, you know, easy photos of like chil uh, skinny children, like a massive big belly, and that would do something. But I was like, maybe let's, let's, let's do something different. Let's get some like beautiful um, imagery, nice, nice photos and videos, and then with a, with a, with a strong story. So that's what I was really trying to do to you know, humanize these, um, these guys, that despite of what is happening to, to them, because these guys are really, I'm telling you, like, like really struggling, mm. like really struggling. I was with one other guy, Manaisu, and then I was filming for like three days, four days with these guys, and I have noticed that I, I was waiting for them to, you know, to, to light the fire and cook something, because I wanted to get some, you know, the, this nice stuff of the fire, and then the smoke and everything, that they don't do anything. And at some point, I was asking them, are you guys, when are you guys cooking? And they said, there's nothing to cook. And they haven't eaten for three days. And when I, when I ask, what they do is they, when they have nothing to eat, they go to the field and then um, you know, grab to the forest and grab some cactus fruit. And then that is what they uh, uh, eat. Um, and then sometimes they, they sell their cooking pot. The last option is selling their cooking pot and they buy a bit of rice. And then she skip like breakfast and lunch and save it for um, you know for dinner for her ki children because she hates you know her um, hearing her like children she can't handle it hearing her children crying at night because of hunger and um, one other thing that really like hit me really hard was when well, one asked Manesu told me that uh, uh, the thing that he's the most like scared of is that losing one of her like children because of um, the, the water they're drinking and starvation combined. So having experienced these different places, what, what do you think the solution is or how do you think we can help best to find solutions for these issues? Um, yeah, I mean, strategically speaking, um, I think we, we all need to, to work together. Uh, by we, I mean like, uh, the human being, politicians, um, uh, because I think in Madagascar the issue is not really the absence of water, it's more of getting water to communities. Mm. So that's, that's the big deal. And um, uh, we were always like talking about this, is this climate change, no it's just a drought, it has always been like this. I, I don't think like debating if it is a climate change or not is the, the thing we need now. I think what we need now is like we need to act and save people's life. Because uh, at this time like we are speaking, at this time where people are having a meeting and everything and COP and stuff going on, people are dying. So we really need just to act and that's all mm. and do something to save lives. So what you're saying is that there is enough water in Madagascar. There, there are rivers from what we talked about before. There seem to be a lot of water in lots of areas in Madagascar. The issue is just that certain areas don't have access to these water or maybe it's just too far away. You just need to build more infrastructure or just find a way to get the water from the large areas, concentrated areas to the places exactly. that don't have it. Yeah, exactly. As I said, like we have water in Madagascar. In the deep south, we have water, we have rivers, we have, we have like um, groundwater. But they just need to, 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 to get to the communities. Good people need to access them. Because I don't think like, um, people would be able to like, really improve their life if they spend like, five hours, ten hours a day fetching water. How would you like, improve your life if you spend that, um, that time just fetching water and you have to do that every single day? For example, the, the case of like, Florin, my lady, who can't fetch water anymore, uh, she's running a little coffee, coffee shop. She's making two GBP a day, but she has to like spend um, the, the benefit she's making to spend water, not only one jerry can per day, but three, four, five jerry can per day. So that, that is really impossible to like really improving life and saving life if they spend in their, the time they have just to do that. Well, it sounds like the work that you're doing is really impactful and definitely here at Water Aid, we've seen that it's 
it's really working. So um, I just want to say thank you for all the work that you do in going to these communities and been supporting them as well. So thank you very much for that. Yeah. It's been wonderful speaking to you. So yeah, it's amazing. Thank you so much as well for having me. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.